Okay, here we're going to continue our discussion of inverse trig functions. And what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to do the first four examples here, A, B, C, D, uh, evaluating uh, inverse trig functions. The first two are easy, uh, again, using just using our cancellation laws here. Again, making a note of the restriction on the domains. So for part A, we have sine of inverse sine of 0 0.4. Well, it says if you it says if you take sine inverse sine of some number, it says you get exactly that number back as long as that number is between negative 1 and 1. So in this case, basically the idea is these just cancel out and you get 0 0.4. Okay? So nothing to do there. Uh, a quick note, if it was something like sine of inverse sine say of 2.4, this would actually be undefined, okay? And the reason is simply because inverse sine of 2.4 is undefined. I mean, if you think, you know, sine of what number is 2.4? Well, there's not any, okay? So let me even do one other example here because I want to. Um, suppose we wanted to evaluate inverse sine of 1 half. Well, again, the solution here, whatever the solution is, this solution has to be between positive pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. This is what makes things uh, unique. So I tend to think about angles in terms of the unit circle. So negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. That was the interval that we restrict ourselves to. So basically I'm thinking, for what angle between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, sine of what angle is 1 half? Well, at the angle pi over 6, recall that that hits the unit circle at the ordered pair 3 over 2 comma 1 half. Well, the y coordinate has to do with sine. So it says our solution here is going to be pi over 6. And again, that's because or since, well, sine of pi over 6, that equals 1 half. And again, it's the angle that's between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Again, there's lots of angles. Sine of infinitely many angles equals 1 half. There's lots of them. But again, we have to restrict ourselves between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So this is kind of some of the, the subtle stuff. Likewise, again, you know, sine, there's, there's no angle that you know, sine of some angle that would give you 2.4. So that's why this would be undefined. So again, subtle little things, absolutely, uh, if that seems at all a, a bit, uh, you know, maybe confusing, I would say rewatch it, okay? This is important little stuff, okay? Just kind of the, the subtle stuff, the nuances. Alrighty, so, uh, so actually you got an extra example there. So part B, uh, inverse sine of sine of pi over 6. Well, now I'm looking at my first cancellation law. And that says if we have inverse sine and sine of something, it says we get that, that something as long as the angle or the value is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Well, pi over 6 definitely falls in that interval. So hey, it simply says that we'll get pi over 6 as our solution to part B. Uh, part C here, now this is where we've got to be careful. So inverse sine of sine of 2 pi over 3. It would be easy just to say, well, oh hey, it's inverse sine and sine, and these cancel out and we get 2 pi over 3. But that is absolutely not correct, okay? So that would be something, you know, I would put on a quiz or a test just to make sure that people are... are paying attention to these intervals. And again, the reason why this is not correct, it says you only get that value x if the angle is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Well, 2 pi over 3 is not in between. It is greater than negative pi over 2, but it's not less than or equal to pi over 2. So it doesn't fall in that interval, and that's why it's not correct. That doesn't mean we can't evaluate it. It just means we have to do something slightly different. Well, let's see, sine of 2 pi over 3. What is sine of 2 pi over 3? Again, I I never for the life of me memorized these. I always had to think about unit circle stuff. 
So let's see, that's 1 half root 3 over 2. If we think about the angle, okay, so if we think about the angle 2 pi over 3, again, different people obviously have different ways of thinking about them. This is how I do it. That's negative 1 half, the x coordinate, which d doesn't really matter. The y coordinate there is the square root of 3 over 2. Still, it's positive since we're in the second quadrant. So this is going to give us inverse sine of, well, square root of 3 over 2. Okay, so all I'm doing is, in this case, just saying, well, sine of 2 pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. And this is where I have to evaluate inverse sine of root 3 over 2. So again, it says this is going to equal, just like we did a second ago, this is going to equal some angle, but the angle has to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So I'm thinking, where on the unit circle between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, what angle would give me root 3 over 2? Well, the answer is simply going to be positive pi over 3. So inverse sine of root 3 over 2 is going to equal pi over 3. Again, that unique angle between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So this is kind of the, uh, the example I wanted to be extra careful about, this, uh, this part D, just to show you that, hey, you can't, uh, you can't just uh, apply these cancellation laws thoughtlessly. You have, to be, you have to be careful about what you do. Again, it's all about the domain. All right, let's do one last example here. Let's do arc tangent or inverse tangent of square root of 3. And again, there's only a handful of values that I could do without a calculator. And again, it just comes down to unit circle stuff. So this equals something. And again, based on the restriction, it says our solution, remember how we chopped up tangent that's between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. That's how we made it a 1 to 1 function. So likewise, our angle here has to lie between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So again, I go back to unit circle stuff. Okay, so this is the angle negative pi over 2 at the bottom and positive pi over 2 at the top. So, you know, it's a lot of if you if you have a hard time with the unit circle or you know sine and co you know what sine of pi over six what sine of pi over three um, that stuff inverse trig stuff's going to be a nightmare I, I simply don't know how you would do it I guess you'd break out a calculator all right so to figure out inverse tangent of square root of three equivalently I'm thinking tangent of what angle equals square root of 3. That's really what I'm thinking about. Again, let me say it for the tenth time. Again, our angle, though, has to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So let's see here. Um, at pi over 3, or excuse me, at pi over 6, we've got root 3 over 2, comma, 1 half. Well, let's see. Tangent is sine over cosine. So if I do 1 half divided by root 3 over 2, that's not going to give me root 3. But at the angle pi over 3, again, that's where we have the ordered pair 1 half comma root 3 over 2. So again, in this case, notice that if we take tangent of pi over 3, well, hey, that's going to be, again, just to emphasize, sine over cosine. Sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. Cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. If you flip and multiply, we just get square root of 3. So in fact, hey, it says tangent of pi over 3 equals square root of 3. Therefore, the inverse tangent of square root of 3 equals pi over 3. So again, whenever I think about inverse functions, you know, something like this, you know, inverse tangent of square root of 3, that equals what? I kind of turn it into a uh, a, a problem involving the regular trig functions. So inverse tangent of square root of 3, that equals some angle. Equivalently, you can say tangent of what angle equals square root of 3. 
again, the angle has to be in the uh, prescribed interval. And again, that's what makes the solution unique. Otherwise, if you didn't have to worry about this interval stuff, you'd have infinitely many solutions and it wouldn't be a function, and then things would be more confusing. So, all right, I hope these uh, four examples, well, five examples, make some sense. I'm going to do the other ones as well for sure. And again, I think inverse trig stuff, if you're, if you're shaky with regular trig, inverse trig is going to be a hassle. So if this stuff is confusing, I would say definitely go back and just make sure that you can evaluate, you know, regular trig functions at, you know, th those, those specific angles, pi over 6, pi over 2, pi over 3, etc., etc., etc. And I think that'll go a long ways towards helping you make sense out of the inverse trig functions. I mean, obviously, they're, they're intimately related, so... Uh, so, okay, all right, I hope this makes some sense. I'll do those, uh, those other, I think, three examples, uh, E, F, and G. I'll do those in my, my next example. And to do these, the idea is we're actually going to use right triangles. And you'll see that same idea when we simplify part H and part I as well.